Have you heard the joke about the two high-achieving Asian doctors who went into a bar? Clearly, the bar wasn't high enough. <laughs> I can laugh now, but for most of my life, I was that person. Raised in a typical Asian household, being a high achiever was a baseline assumption. I was taught that good enough was never good enough. This continued at the prestigious All Girls Academy where I went to school. I was surrounded by a group of overachievers and perfectionists, and I was totally fine with that. If you are the person, you know what I mean, and you don't have to be Asian to relate. You know how that kind of environment can push a high achiever like me to push myself even harder. I did the same in medical school and residency. Looking back, I can see I was headed toward burnout, but it's not something that I would have been able to see then, much less say out loud, even to myself. When things got crazy busy, I got crazy busy with them. Never stopping to think, never stopping, running from ward to ward, from patient to patient, doing my charts, never feeling like I was moving fast enough. I even scolded myself for needing to use the bathroom. And just an FYI, the moment you find yourself wishing that you had a catheter, that's the time to slow down. But slowing down is the last thing that a lone ranger like me is likely to do. Likely to do. Think of the actual lone ranger. His whole job is saving other people. It's a lot like being a doctor. You gallop in when everything seems lost. You've even got a mask on. You save the day and then gallop off to save the next person. Like a lot of doctors, the last person the lone ranger worries about is himself. He doesn't have time for that. There are people who need to be saved. That was me. It wasn't just that I was uncomfortable with weakness. I saw it as a personal failure. To ask for help would have been like admitting I wasn't capable. Dare I say, not competent. Yes, the medical system was to blame. But I did what so many of us do. Whether we're in medicine, or another high pressure, high stakes profession, and that is to blame myself. It's something that a lot of people feel. When we experience adversity, we criticize ourselves. And that self-criticism ends up putting us in a spiral of negativity. That slide from self-criticism to low self-worth to losing our sense of who we are is one that's hardwired into our brains. It comes from the limbic system, the oldest and most primitive part of the brain. It's that part of the brain that responds when we feel like we're not measuring up, not good enough, not enough. The limbic system perceives that thought of not being good enough as a threat and tells us, get ready to fight or get ready to run for our lives. When our threat system gets triggered, our brain releases the stress hormone cortisol and this activates the sympathetic nervous system, the fight flight response, which sends a signal to the body telling it to brace itself because danger is approaching. Once upon a time, that fight flight response made a lot of sense. It kept us safe. There's a very clear adaptive value to it. If you're walking through the jungle and you find yourself face to face with a lion, it's not the time for leisurely contemplation. You don't sit down and sort through your feelings. It's time to move. The limbic system kicks in and before you know it, you're running for your life. The problem? Well, it's actually a good thing that lions are not as much of a threat as they were once. We know that intellectually. But it's not something that the more primitive parts of our brains have caught on to entirely. It's not your brain's fault. It took millions of years to evolve. And the fact we're rarely in situations that demand an immediate fight and flight responses, at least from our evolutionary perspective, a relatively recent development. It's for that reason that when our self-concept is being threatened, when we tell ourselves that we're not good enough, 
Our brain reacts as if there's a lion behind us, one that's stuck on our back and following us everywhere. It's like our brain is motivating us with a baseball bat, which is not very effective. When I was a resident doctor, rushing and running through my rounds, that's how it felt. Like I was being chased, barreling along, not thinking where I was headed, not thinking, not knowing how or when I was going to stop, and not knowing how much I needed to. The day that it changed for me was the 10th of September, 2008. It was a day like any other, or should have been. I remember seeing the old worn-out Toyota beginning to reverse out of its parking spot. I didn't think much of it until it ran me over. What happened after that is a blur. What I remember is being thrown up in the air and hitting the ground hard. When I opened my eyes, I felt an excruciating pain in my lower back. Time stood still. As I lay there on the pavement, I slowly put together what happened. First off, I was still alive. I knew that much. That was good news. The doctor part of my brain kicked in, and that was more good news. The fact that I was able to think meant that I didn't have a traumatic head injury. I started moving my arms and concluded I was not quadriplegic. But then I realized I couldn't move or feel my legs, and I started to panic. I knew it meant I had a spinal cord injury. Specifically, it was what doctors call spinal shock, where there is loss of sensation accompanied by motor paralysis, with complete loss or weakening of reflexes. That moment changed my life. I was rushed to the hospital. And found myself abruptly on the other side of the healthcare system as a patient. Those first days in the hospital were the most challenging of my life. I felt like a pin cushion, with drips on my arms and a feeding tube up my nose. And yes, I had that catheter that I had been strictly wishing for just a few months earlier. I had never felt so vulnerable. So broken and helpless, I would close my eyes and muster all the willpower I could to try to move my legs. Nothing, and then nothing again. I didn't know if I would ever walk again, if I would ever be able to practice medicine, if I would ever have kids. I worried that my husband. Will leave me because I became such a burden to him. Once upon a time, I had imagined myself the lone ranger, self-sufficient and incapable of weakness. And now, I really felt alone, in a negative spiral of a victim mindset, my own worst enemy, and in a dark space where my idea of myself. Felt entirely lost. Then one day, I heard about a center for spinal cord injury recovery in San Diego, United States. It was there, under the very watchful eye of my trainer Mika, that I overcame my fear of standing on my own. You got this, she told me, and I took my first few painfully slow steps. It had been three years since my accident. The doctor is back in the house. I heard myself say, "Where did that voice come from? Who was that person who was able to see past all the tragedy, all the unfairness, to see what was possible, and declare proudly that I was back?" It was me, of course. That was my voice. I had never heard it before then, but now I knew I had to listen to it. I realized then. That if I was going to be able to fully recover, to get back to the life I loved, the profession I love, the person I knew myself to be, that I will have to find a way to get me to believe in myself. 
if I was going to get through this, I will need to have my own back to be my own best friend. That was a revelation. When I first arrived at the center, I had imagined that it will be the cutting edge technology that will help me recover. The truth I found was that everything I needed was within myself. What I really needed was self-compassion, self-acceptance, and to let go of the self-critical, hyper-high-achieving attitude that used to define me. Instead of being on autopilot, I had to slow down and be mindful, literally, of each slow step I was going to take. I took off my Lone Ranger mask and connected with my fellow spinal cord injury survivors bound together by our common humanity and our common suffering. Most important of all, instead of being a perfectionist, beating myself up for the tiniest mistake I made, I learned to accept myself for who I was. Mindfulness, common humanity, self-acceptance. These are the three pillars of self-compassion. And it was through them I learned what it meant to be my own best friend. Yes, there were times when I felt like giving up. But that's true of a lot of us. It's something that I see on a daily basis in my work today as a pain physician. When patients arrive in my office, they often feel like they're at the end of the line. They've given up ever getting rid of their pain. And most seriously, they've given up on themselves. Hold on, I tell them. How will you treat a best friend? Now treat yourself that way. We're there for others, but we need to be there for ourselves. It means believing in yourself. It means having your own back, remembering that you are your own best friend. But that's easy to forget. I want to close by sharing with you a simple thing that anyone can do to remind you. It's something that I would do during those darkest days of rehab to remind myself that I had my own back and to be my own best friend. First, let me see you raise your hand. Your right or left, it doesn't matter. What feels right to you right now, put it on your heart. Go ahead. I know, even though it feels a little strange, now take three deep breaths. Feel how this breathing activates your parasympathetic nervous system. That's the part of your brain that's designed to calm you down and may you feel safe. The hand on the heart leads to the release of oxytocin into the bloodstream. It's like cuddling a newborn baby, like hugging your best friend, telling her that it'll be all right, that you are with her no matter what. You can do that for yourself. It only takes 10 seconds, but it could save your job, your marriage, or your life. The sooner we leave our Lone Ranger behind, the sooner we can develop true self-compassion, and the sooner we can all start to heal. Thank you.